everyone. Welcome. Hello, Elder Tesh. Thank you to the IPR Ministry. Um, I'm guessing I'm all right to begin. Yes, you may begin. Thank you, Elder Shkweda. Uh, if we could just have a silent prayer. Amen. Going to start this camp meeting with a question. I'm going to be mean from the very beginning because it's a trick question. Where did Adventism go wrong? What does Adventism do that's so wrong? That's left them in 2021 essentially blind. To where they are prophetically. I want to read a review and herald. It's a famous quote. Review and herald, October 12, 1905, paragraph 22. Starting one sentence in. In reviewing our past history, Having travelled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God. As I see what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. So I'm talking about present day Adventism. And if we were to read this quote as it reads, if all they did was remember the past, they would never have gone off course. So I, I said it was a trick question. So I suspected many people rightly would have first thought of parable teaching and methodology. That's a, a good answer. But I wanted us to think about history. The Midnight Cry of 2018 was controversial in really just one aspect. It's the message of two streams of information that split this movement. And that 
message said we need to be media literate. If we're going to understand present and future events, we need to look at all the information put out mostly on the World Wide Web. and learn how to divide truth from error. Now in a past simple dispensation, this was put simply as CNN versus Fox. Two sources that would both claim to be journalistic. Now I would like to note that neither source are memes, YouTube or social influencers. or comedians. We're talking about journalism. Obviously, it's become a little bit more complex since then. We're in a new dispensation, which naturally has made that message need to be refined. And we can see it's it's not entirely simple. But if we understand that we need to prophetically identify external events, we have to pr prophetically identify what those events even look like. So if you're looking at something external like September 11, 2001, before you can even take a methodology to that external event, You have to understand what that external event even was, what happened. There's no point having good parable methodology if your idea of external events is rooted in, in some type of fantasy. So you would notice that last Sabbath, when we covered the history of May 2020 to August And we reviewed what I had taught through that time period. It was probably about 90% history. And 10% application. How could we understand Adventism today? without understanding the end of ancient Israel? How can we understand the end of ancient Israel without understanding where they went wrong in the alpha of ancient Israel? 
How can we understand their golden calf? If we don't understand pagan Egypt and their Agnes Bull. How can we understand where Adventism imbibed Protestantism? If we didn't understand Protestant history and where Protestantism went wrong, how can we understand Protestantism's mess if we have a fairy tale idea about the Protestant Reformation? It's all connected. By the time you get to the history of Christ, like Ellen White, Paul could have said, Christ could have said, we need to remember God's leading in our past history. And I would argue that part of that understanding is the history of ancient Israel. And unlike modern Israel, the history of ancient Israel is encoded in the Old Testament. So if God recognises the importance of us tracing our history, for ancient Israel, he put it all in writing. We have nothing to fear except we forget how God has led us. When we look at the Old Testament, is this just some pretty story of when God and humanity worked together? Or is this an ugly history of God leading a rebellious humanity? I think we can tend to read this and think that maybe God wants us to remember the pretty parts. That these just aren't pretty parts of answered promises. If it's just the pretty parts, we would miss most of the story. And we would not learn our lessons. So we have to remember not just the nice part of our history, but the parts that look ugly. When we look back and see the past correctly, it has massive implications on how we view present and what we expect for future. So in the Old Testament, God gives us, I would suggest, an example of what this quote should mean. Because John the Baptist could have pointed back and said, look how God led us. And that history 
was not just theirs, but also the history of paganism. that intersected and interacted with their history. So if we are looking back at Adventism, and seeing how God has led and directed, through the ugly parts and the nice looking parts, We also have to look at the external and how that has intersected and interacted with Adventism. History is so important. What the message has required is not just the methodology to unpack biblical and wider history, but we needed a true history, remembrance of that history to begin with. So it's not just present that the message of two streams of information applies to. It applies to the past. As an introduction to this camp meeting, I want to touch on just a couple of things that have been already covered multiple times. But we will remind ourselves. I wanted to first remind us of the importance of history. And that's why much of what we have covered over the last 18 months and before is just history. And to prepare you that the vast majority of this camp meeting will just be 90% history. 10% application. Because especially as we go into the subjects that I want to tackle at this camp meeting, the reason that there are so many differing views on these subjects because people either completely ignore history or they take their biases and they misinterpret history. In 2018 came the midnight cry. In 2019 came the increase of knowledge of the Sunday. And where did that increase of knowledge start? Because a way mark is a point in time and a period of time. I would suggest that it began at the Brazil camp meeting. April of 2019. I think it might have been March, but it was that time period. Meeting that we began to more forcefully tackle some things that opened up with the midnight. 
we looked at the, the Battle of Ipsus. We saw that Hillary Clinton should have won, which would have made a, a woman uh, in the highest position on earth. For the first time in world history, the most powerful person on the planet would have been a woman. And we saw how that was stolen from her. But it should have been hers. We looked at 2015 women's ordination within Adventism. And this develops over that increase of knowledge. Women should have been ordained. But the reason we were able to say that in August is because in 2015, we looked at civil marriage. and realised that the allowance for gay civil marriage in 2015 was correct. So 2015, gay marriage, correct. 2015, Adventism, Women's ordination should have taken place. It was blocked by the socially conservative faction of the Adventist Conference. And not as much publicly, but certainly privately, we began to discuss and teach the compare and contrast between the King of the North and the King of the South. And recognize them as polar opposites. So by the time we get to August of 2019, What has really come to establish that message is the study of Eden to Eden and the compare and the contrast between racism and sexism. Now I'm drawing it differently today. and putting both issues on this top line. I'll, I'll save this to remind us of time spans. Gender, E. Issue number one. Race, Ham and Canaan. At that stage it was issue number two, but we've added since then. And since then we have compared and contrasted these two issues, um, two curses on Eve and on Ham. We showed how the issue of slavery was institutionalized after Ham as a result of that curse. 
not really a, just to clarify, a curse is a, a prophetic statement. God is not decreeing it, it's a prophetic statement of the inevitable results of what just took place. But we've covered that in past presentations. This is ancient Israel. This is modern Israel. We have Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. Down here we looked at um, taking the subject of race. We saw over here the example of Abraham. A slave owner. We come to Leviticus and Deuteronomy. When we look at Leviticus, the establishment of the ancient glorious land, especially Leviticus 25. 35 to 46. Leviticus 25, 35 to 46. The first portion discusses how to treat your Israelite brothers when they go into poverty. But then, really from verses 43 to 45, 46, it introduces and then discusses how you are to enslave the people uh, around you. And rule over them with rigor. So the institutionalization of slavery at the beginning of ancient Israel. And then Deuteronomy 22.5, we all know. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination. Sounds like strong words to be called an abomination. But with the compare and the contrast, from 2019, through to when Elder Parminder pulled this text apart in Uganda of 2020, it was broken down and understood. The original context of this verse is not clothes. As we've said many times, they all wore the same thing. It's an issue of gender roles. That they are not to break down gender roles. <laughs> 
here, we see Solomon. Slavery. I think everyone knows his position with women. Changes in their Omega history. Under Leviticus, Israelites and non-Israelites were to be treated very differently. That all changes under the Omega history when they all get treated the same. Only men went into covenant. Now there's no Jew, nor Greek, male, nor female. When it comes to a very narrow definition, there was no gender. Liberal Adventists try and use that text to dismantle a lot of things today. They use that text and say, see, there was no headship after this. There clearly was. It's an, that text is covering a, a very narrow aspect of, of where, um, of male and female. You go to Ephesians 5 and 6. We see both slavery and headship reinforced. I think that's six and seven. I'll have to check that. Someone can correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. So we have these sins, and since then we've added Cain. Issue number two, worship. And these, here where humanity became so messed up, is what God is going to bend his efforts to correct. In the history of the time of the end. Now we're going to work our way through backwards. One, two, three. Three, two, one. Racism, Millerite history. Worship, 1888 history. Gender and patriarchy, our history. Ham, Cain, Eve. Much of what we've understood about gender comes from the compare and contrast. comparing number one and number three. If you're going to treat them the same, 
and you want to ignore Leviticus 25, you're going to have to seriously consider your position on Deuteronomy 22. And then if you're going to take all of those, thus saith the Lord's, all of those examples of the friends of God, like Abraham, and Ellen White, without explanation or shame, throws it all away in the 1850s and 60s. And that is what we have been combing through when it comes to gender in our history. And also understanding that we still hold to worship the fight over worship and discarding of the Sabbath that we began with Cain. I just want to add a little bit of historical context. We've also, in the last 18 months, reminded ourselves about what time periods this history is covering. From creation to Moses. Without being precise, this is a history of 2,500 years. And it takes until the time of Moses for written language to develop. The scripture to develop. Then we have Babylon. History of John and Christ. Roads, world peace and shipping. Roads, world peace, and shipping. Protestant Reformation. Printing press. Miller Art History. Rail Telegraph. Eighteen eighty eight. World Wide Web. So we also traced how when you come to these particularly key reformatory movements. There is always an external development that allows that light to be shared. One point that I wanted to make more than any other when covering these time spans was to see how hard the work is for God. 
to undo what these three sins introduced. Because I think we have his idea. The Adventism has this idea. That society was really good. That God's people were really good. And now it's all downhill. And when it can't get any worse, Christ will come back. I would argue against that. My argument, which I won't go into make now, is that Adam and Eve were created without knowing much at all. They didn't even know how to garden. And still without a thorough understanding of the character of God, they sin and the relationship is broken. The very first children kill each other. Without a constitution, without restraint. It's survival of the fittest. It gets so bad. God doesn't see a way out of it without a flood. Mass destruction. And this is 6,000 years of progress and education. Just as we've learned how to communicate. To invent. Which I would suggest we were always intended to do. So it is also 6,000 years of progression in understanding the character of God. Which is why we get to here. And Jesus is saying, Why are you stoning people? You were meant to progress. But we have to follow rules to know what that progression was meant to be. So these are the points that have been particularly laid out since 2018. 2019, especially March to August. And 2020, especially since May. Uh, with, of course, points in between, Elder Prime Minister's explanation of Deuteronomy 22, etc. In understanding not just Adventism, but Protestantism, has a profound impact on how we see present and future. But not just that history. We need to correctly understand ancient Israel. But also the external nations that dominated this biblical history. So what powers do you have over here? 
What's what are the superpowers? I want to start with Assyria. Really Mesopotamia. It's not, this is, this is not drawn to, to scale. So I'm not going to be able to make it fit. So we'd end up giving Greece a, about a, a, a centimetre. Assyria, Mesopotamia. Sorry, I will redo. Assyria, Mesopotamia. Egypt. Babylon. Greece. Rome. This is when the Old Testament started to be written, and this was when it was completed. So at least for the writing of those books. These are the external superpowers that encompassed and interacted with God's people. So we're going to go into their history at this time. They wanted us to, to have some type of visualization. Because just like we had to understand Protestant history to understand modern Adventism, We have to understand paganism as well. Not understand not just ancient Israel, but modern. There's one other reminder I wanted to put in place at the introduction. Where are we on the reform line? This is 1999, 2014, 2019, 2021. It's easiest to understand the end of modern Israel by going 
and back. Sorry for that, my internet. We're going to from modern. Remind ourselves of what the ancient can tell us about where we're at. The work of John, Elder Jeff. Baptism. Wilderness. First temple cleansing. Change in leadership. Christ. Parables. Triumphal entry, the midnight cry. The pain of the cross, beginning of time of trouble. Time of trouble and harvest for the disciples. And we've been warning people for some time. What this line warns you about is that when you get to here, Pentecost, the end of ancient Israel tells you that as a priest, you still don't know the implications of the message. Still don't know the implications of this. Two thousand and eighteen and parable teaching. And under the midnight cry of the harvest, I don't want to use the word midnight cry, that's specific. Under the formalization of the harvest, finally, what was laid out here is understood in, in its completeness. So there's three things to this history that we need to remember. One, at Pentecost, disciples finally understand. Two, the theme of this history for us is gender. The test for God's people when it comes to race was here. The test for God's people when it comes to the Sabbath was here. While we are still expected to hold to our lessons learnt here and here, The great final test that comes to God's people is gender. So this history is all about gender. When we take Christ as a priest, then we understand 30 years 
but he doesn't go to work at the end of 30 years because he's not ready. He has to be tested, trained by the experience of the wilderness. And then he needs Canaan. So we know the formalization of this message is the subject of gender combined with the subject of marriage. And one final point. This was laid out in Portugal 2020. I think I may have covered it before, but it was by far done in most detail in Portugal. To, to prepare God's people for, the, for 1989, there were three external movements. And this was a preparation, not just for Israel, but for what was about to happen across the entire world. The first of these was the Civil Rights Movement. We've covered that and the, the subject of racism at great detail. The second was second wave feminism. We have covered that in great detail, but by no means comprehensively. We won't stop talking about this subject until the second advent. And then you're going to have to go and talk to Abraham. He'll get to heaven and have no idea what's going on. And the third movement, Stonewall. that began in 1969 in, at the Stonewall Inn June 28, so around the month of June the fight for LGBTQ rights. Mostly the rights around, civil rights around homosexuality. So we know, we know that pre-1989, These three movements led to the events of this history. Especially second wave feminism and Stonewall. And all the fights that have occurred since, especially 1989 over gender. So the third point, that when we come to this formalization, we need to look at Stonewall. I mean that as a symbol. I mean everything that surrounds LGBTQ 
Right. Some elements of this have already been taught in this movement, but not comprehensively. We've never formally tackled point number three. So I already essentially said this back in Portugal last year. I repeated this, I think it was October 10, 2020. In a presentation, in a presentation for the French world. But the formalization of the message of the harvest had to be an understanding of the message that was already here. Because there's no new message. We're understanding the implications of this. It had to relate to gender. Because this is all the lead up to the Sunday law. In Cana, it had to be about marriage. And I made the claim it would also address LGBTQ. Homosexuality and the fight for gay marriage. That shouldn't surprise you because back in 2019, we were already tackling the subject of gay marriage in 2015. And the connection between that 2015 external ruling and its internal twin women's ordination. Because both subjects center on how we understand gender. I would like, like to make one last point as introduction. For the rest of this camp meeting, we're going to be covering history. First of all, threading the way marks of our movement. With the theme of gay marriage. When we're done with that 32 years of history, We're going to go into paganism. With the same theme addressed to Syria, Egypt, Babylon, Greece, and Rome. It's been three years since we had the increase of knowledge. Sorry, three years since the midnight cry. 2018, and what we taught there was two strains of information. So there's one thing that I won't be teaching at this camp meeting, even though I know many people will have questions about it still. As I discussed homosexuality, I will not be going into the psychology or what makes someone homosexual. 
I'm hoping that everyone in the movement has come to, to the same place that the leadership has. That we understand that homosexuality is not a mental illness. It's not an issue of hormones. It's not a choice. Instead, just like many people are born heterosexual, some people are born homosexual. But the problem is, is people who don't like that or don't agree with that, may require some evidence. And that's what I won't be giving at this camp meeting. I'll be assuming we've all just come to the same place. Of understanding it's not a choice. When people say, prove it, it does get a little difficult. Because when someone says to me, prove that the psychology, that the physical nature of homosexuality, My answer is, prove to me what makes someone heterosexual. And no one can. There's no gene being located that makes you attractive to someone of the opposite sex. People have talked before about the gendered brain. And the one thing more amazing than the information we now have about how the human brain works Even more understand, even more amazing is how much in the past it has been misunderstood. How twisted and manipulated that science has been for generations. There's still so much that people don't understand. And while I might not be going into this camp meeting to prove what makes someone homosexual, if someone has questions on that and they want an answer from science, They need to go to science and prove what makes someone heterosexual. Without that, you have no compare and contrast. I have no idea how people fall in love. What science makes people fall head over heels? or causes physical attraction. Even disconnected from homosexuality, just between heterosexual people, there's a lot we don't understand. 
but what the majority of the scientific community those who do know what they're talking about today the vast majority all acknowledge that homosexuality is not some type of choice and we're going to be discussing homosexuality at this camp meeting from that perspective Going to start covering history when we come back for my next presentation. But before we got to that, I wanted to review. To understand where we are on the reform line, you'll understand why we need to discuss this topic. especially as we understand its relation to gender. You kneel with me, I'll close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for how you have led us in our past history. Even the ugly parts, how you did not give up on your people. And even in these, how you continue to educate us. I pray for your presence at this camp meeting, in the heart and mind of every member. to convict, that we might be committed to this message and understand the glory of your character. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.